Welcome. This morning, I'm here with Dr. Ed Chen from Emory University in Atlanta. I'm, my name is Tom Gleason from the University of Pittsburgh, and we're here to discuss the role of exercise and limitations uh, both before and after cardiac surgery and in the setting of aortic dissection. So I wanted to start with a, with a question for Dr. Chen regarding uh, preoperative assessment and, and uh, potentially patients that are, are in the wake uh, uh, of preparing for uh, cardiac surgery or they have cardiac disease that's not yet uh, requiring or indicated or indicating cardiac surgery but severe enough to potentially impact their ability to exercise and or their uh, safety with respect to um, exertion. So Ed, for an aortic stenosis, patient with aortic, severe aortic stenosis, either you're planning surgery or you're uh, waiting for, for a time of intervention, what is your general guideline for those patients with respect to exercise? Well, Tom, you know, a lot of the patients that we operate on now for tight, severe AS are very young because of all the transcatheter valve trials that are going on. And typically, these are very active patients that have, over time, developed symptomatic um, ex dysmal exertion or fatigue and have, have severely impacted their lifestyle. I think that, you know, we have a little bit of waiting time once we make a decision to operate and they agree and it's a few weeks, and, and the, you're right, the question is, well, how much can I do? And I think it's important for patients to be active in general, to, to not suddenly shift to a sedentary lifestyle, because I think the more physically fit they are going into an operation, the better they'll do. So we want them to, to at least do some, some decent walking, um, but we, we emphasize that it's important not to increase their activity level to a degree where they're very symptomatic, to use good judgment, uh, to continue to walk, you know, perhaps not vigorous exercise, but at least brisk walking in a way that they can um, at least stay active, but, but not, you know, put themselves in any types of danger. To that end, do, do you ever have concerns about doing an exercise stress test in those patients? Do you, do you use an exercise stress test to help m determine uh, relative indication at the, for, for time of intervention? In that, in that specific population? You, you know, we, uh, we use exercise stress tests in the setting of a patient who does not appear to have a lot of symptoms with significant questioning, but their echo um, findings are very concerning. For instance, a peak velocity or a, a velocity over five meters per second, uh, you know, high gradients, a critical AS, you know, a valve area of less than 0.5, peak gradient of 100, you know, mean uh, over 50, and I, but you know, but when you question them and, and they still stay there active, they just don't really note any kind or document any type of drop off in their activity level. So at, at that point, we might get an exercise stress test or someone who has a lot of symptoms, but their valve pathology based on echo criteria or just don't quite meet the severe category. Do you make any dis, uh, distinction with respect to your recommendation? Uh, vis-a-vis uh, -vis exercise limitation for type of symptom, uh, in other words, angina, dyspnea, or syncope? I think it's, uh, you know, typically we, we obviously never want them to have syncope, but I think with respect to angina or dyspnea, uh, we really don't want them to feel those symptoms. So I think we're, oh, we're, we allow them or, or recommend that they um, participate in whatever activity they enjoy, uh, but, but, but if they start to experience any of those symptoms, then they, they, they should stop until after the operation. How about in the, uh, post-operatively? So any, let's, let's say post-cardiotomy for valve disease, post-cardiotomy for uh, ischemic disease, coronary disease. Do you have different recommendations, similar, is it standard protocol? When, when do you allow exercise, and at what point would you liberalize to, to, to ad lib? I think that we, um, within the first six weeks, while um, their incisions and wounds are healing, uh, we want them um, to stay active, and typically that's just walking really as much as they can. We have guidelines in some of the books, pamphlets that we hand out to patients that just as a general guide in recovering from surgery, but um, I think that uh, 
but typically the activity is just to be uh, to have good walking. When we see them back in the office for their post-op visit. I think that we um, will see how assess how they're doing, recovering overall, and if they have fully recovered, to, to speak, uh, so to speak, or they feel they want to uh, increase activity, we ask them to just uh, liberalize their activity, and no more restrictions with straining and so things like that, uh, for at least a few weeks, and then after. A couple weeks gone by. If everything is going well, then then we we liberalize it. Mm -hmm. Do you have a what about well? What about I was going to ask, uh, Gore. What about the patient who's an elite athlete or a, a, a comes in uh, with a with a with a previous lifestyle that includes a lot of rigorous exercise? And they do you uh, try to uh, place some limitations on those patients, or do you allow them to pro to proceed as as they tolerate in the post-op period. In the post-op period, I think we just allow them to proceed as they tolerate. To be honest, I think uh, one of the re goals for us is, is to restore a patients' uh, quality of life to the degree that, that they desire or can tolerate. And I, I, I wouldn't necessarily, and I understand we have patients that do triath or Iron Man competitions, triathletes, those types of level of, of vigorous exercise, very competitive. And I think once they get beyond the six to eight week mark, we ask them to use good judgment and in increase their activity level. But after a certain period of time, I think we just allow them to, to go back to you know what they were doing before, as, as long as they can tolerate it. And as you know, recovery from surgery may be the limiting factor. It may not be their their own, um, you know, it may not be the the, the operation we did or or, uh, or the uh, uh, or their own limits. It may just be the physiology of recovery that may limit that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think those are the same types of recommendations that we would we would uh, recommend. Now, let's move on to aortic dissection. I think this is a topic of uh, the role of exercise and the limitations that should be imparted in the setting of uh, a, either post re reconstruction of a type A dissection with residual uh, descending and thoracal abdominal dissection, or the patient that's being medically managed with a type B dissection. A lot of controversy here, what, what these patients uh, should or shouldn't be allowed to do. So let, let's start with both uh, exercise instruction and uh, pot potential weight lifting restriction. What do you think? I think in terms of exercise for any type of dissection or with residual aortic disease, aneurysmal enlargement, I, I think we still feel that they should um, be okay. we feel they're or, or it's reasonable to allow them to exercise to whatever de degree they want to particularly a young patient that's very active and we certainly have those as, as I know you do because I think those patients uh, you know you take away the quality of life I think in terms of weight lifting uh, we do put some restrictions on that because uh, as you know uh, weight lifting in and of itself is a risk factor for dissection in certain young patient populations but I think we we don't want them to lift weights to the degree that they have a severe straining or they have um, extreme uh, jugular venous distension, uh, similar to what you see during the Summer Olympics, during those competitive uh, games. I think we, w the, in terms of weight lifting, it's important to maintain tone for them, but probably not to, to, res to, to, uh, to assume the life of a bodybuilder, so to speak. And if, we, if you had to put a hard number on it, it would be somewhere between 50 to 75 pounds is what we typically say. And how about when you speak of the exercise, you're referring to aerobic exercise predominantly? Aer yeah, aerobic yeah. exercise, yeah. treadmill, mm -hmm. bicycling, you know, those types of things. What, what, is, are, what about contact sports? Um, we haven't had actually too many people, uh, you know, to be honest, I'm not sure I've had a patient that has asked about contact sports. Uh, I suppose rugby would be one that comes to mind something like that. I think I would allow them to play soccer if that's what they chose. Whether contact sports, I, I probably would be okay with that to be honest as well, as long as it didn't, didn't involve um, heavy um, straining, which typically those things do not. But I think uh, if that's something that was important to them, we would at least have a discussion and then uh, you know, talk about uh, parameters of concern and, and then you know, come to a mutually agreeable decision. I think it's important for us is as physicians not to, um, you know, we want our patients to 
enjoy their life, have a good quality of life, and we don't want the disease process to limit them. And that's, that's the philosophy we take. And typically, we haven't really had a patient who we've given these instructions to, even for patients that we want to survey and not operate on immediately, that have actually come back and had a catastrophic event because of, of the activities they were participating in. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and, and to your last point, you mentioned uh, in that uh, algorithm that you had aneurysm as well. In, in this, so in other words, a patient that hasn't had dissection but has potential risk for dissection, do you use a similar strategy with respect to particularly uh, more aggressive uh, sports and or weightlifting or competitive sports? Do you, do you, this is a patient, I'm, the classic example might be a, a young bicuspid patient that has a functional valve, has a mild to moderate dilatation that you're continuing to follow. What kind of uh, guideline do you, do you impose on them? Well, I think I have, I can think of a couple patients that were, would fit the category that you're describing where they were highly competitive uh, bicyclists or triathletes and, and they had aortic disease that was um, not, didn't quite meet uh, the guidelines at five and a half centimeters for a bicuspid valve. But you know, they were in the 5.2, 5.3 range. And we had a discussion uh, uh, with them and they, these were just extreme levels of physical activity that probably beyond the typical aerobic exercise that, that the rest of us would probably participate in on the weekends. And I think those patients we actually did operate on, you know, I don't think I would worry about it too much in someone whose aorta was less than five centimeters. I don't think that with a functioning valve that would meet surgical indications and even in the five centimeter range. But these aortas were creeping up a little bit. And to be honest, they also had a little bit of valve dysfunction. And I don't, I can't recall if they were completely, if it was affecting their, 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 their um, c competitiveness in the sports, their ability to perform and how well they did. But uh, those were a couple examples in, in those situations where after discussion that we thought it was probably better just to, to go ahead and, and intervene upon the, on them. So. One last question with uh, respect to the dissection population. This is post reconstruction or in, in patients that are under surveillance with, an, with a chronic dissection. What about work? When they, when it, specifically if their uh, employment requires manual labor, do you, uh, there's a lot of patients like this that are out there on disability because they're, they've been recommended that they don't work. How, does, how do you and your group handle that circumstance? I think that uh, for post uh, this type A dissection repair or even some sort of type B intervention, whether endovascular or, or an open, I think if we look at one, how they recover. You know, for the patient that makes a very nice recovery, has a strong desire to go back to work uh, and does manual labor, uh, I still, we want them to um, make a, have a, a decent livelihood and, and we would uh, have similar recommendations to exercising. Uh, to not, it's okay to lift uh, boxes or whatever manual labor is involved with the job, but, but probably not to strain too heavily. And it's a very subjective recommendation to be honest, because when you talk about manual labor, you could certainly lift boxes and they may have a certain weight or they may be pushing ob heavy objects or, or whatnot. And, and I think we just ask that they um, keep the, the straining, the, the, the muscle um, straining in terms of um, you know, how, how much uh, Valsalva maneuvers it takes to do these things, uh, you know, to, uh, within just to moderate it, keep it moderated at a moderate level. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree that we would encourage, in our group, we would encourage folks to, to get back to work and, and if they're in, in a situation where they are required to lift uh, real heavy uh, things that would require straining, I think that's, a, that's the one circumstance where we would try to work with their employer and modify their, their, uh, their uh, work requirements su such that they could continue to work, but I, I agree. Well, thanks a lot, Ed. Uh, this was a great discussion. Uh, I think it's, a, it's an area that is, is, is uh, there's a lot of myth and there's out in the community on what is appropriate and what's not. I think it sounds like both our institutions are, are fairly liberal with exercise, encouraging uh, activity in most of these cardiovascular patients. Thanks very much.